for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Monday evening, March the 30th, 1970, Evangelistic Temple in Houston, Texas, with Dr. Derek Prince. Dr. Prince is coming now to bring the Bible study. Brother Prince? And I'm going to seek to make it possible for you to leave in good time, because we'd like to see many of you back at 10 o'clock in the morning for the morning Bible study. Now, the primary aim of these meetings these five days that I'm here is systematic Bible teaching. Now, this evening, I am not going to bring you primarily a, an expository message. I feel the Lord has shown me that I should give you some personal testimony. This will be designed to lead into some of the themes of ministry later in the week. Uh, I'm doing this because I'm going to deal on a, deal with a subject which is controversial and frequently misunderstood, and I've discovered that one of the best ways of breaking down misunderstanding is by starting with personal testimony. You see, you can argue with an exposition of scripture, but you can't really argue with somebody's testimony unless you want to call them a liar. And I'm going to seek honestly to tell you the truth as plainly as I can. I'm going to tell you about a new phase of my ministry which developed around about 1962, and it is on this themes that the Lord has led me to, into in this phase of ministry that I will be speaking later. But I would like to go back just briefly to let you know where I came from and how I started and so on. Of course, I don't need to tell you yet that I'm not an American born. Uh, I was born in India, of British parents, brought up in Britain, educated at Eton College as a scholar, and then as a scholar of King's College and the University of Cambridge. At the age of 25, I became what you would call a resident professor of philosophy in Cambridge University. All this time, I had never once heard the gospel preached, and I had never met a person who testified to me from personal experience that he was born again. Then I was called up into the British forces and became a conscience objector and therefore a medical orderly and spent five and a half years in the British Army and Second World War as a medical orderly. Of that time, I spent four and a half years overseas. In my first year in the Army, I began to study the Bible as a work of philosophy, which I felt it was my philosophic duty to study, and found it the first book that really baffled me and confused me. I could not understand it. I could not make any sense out of it. While I was groping my way through the Bible, I met some Pentecostal people. I did not know they were Pentecostal. I didn't know what it was to be Pentecostal. I'd never heard of Pentecostal people. I'd never heard of the Assemblies of God. In fact, I'd never heard of the Baptists. That may sound shocking to some of you. I didn't even know they were Baptists. When I met these people, I realized instantly they had something I did not have, and it was the thing that I'd been looking for in vain for years. Because of a barrier of communication, they didn't succeed in getting across to me exactly what it was or how to get it. So, uh, in desperation, eventually, I decided to pray in an army barrack room one night until I got whatever these people had. And sometime after midnight, I got it. There was no one else present except one other soldier who was asleep. The Spirit of God fell upon me in an extremely powerful way, cast me upon the ground and kept me there for something like one or two hours, purged me of my sin and demon power that had bound me, and revealed Jesus Christ to me as a living person. Approximately two weeks later, in the same army barrack room, at about 9.30 in the evening, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The barrack room was empty at that time, and it was in that barrack room that I first spoke with another tongue as the Spirit of God gave me to speak. At that time, God laid his hand upon my life and called me, although I did not understand this technical phraseology about being called. And when I stepped out of the British Army, four and a half years later, the day I left the army, I was released from the forces in Palestine and became a missionary, full gospel missionary to the Jewish people in Israel. That was in 1946. And I have been in full-time, full-gospel ministry from 1946 until the present day, which is approximately 24 years. During that time, I have ministered and fellowship with and been received by Pentecostal organizations and churches in Norway, 
Sweden, Denmark, Britain, Canada, United States, and Africa. I have known Pentecostal people by close, intimate, personal fellowship in many areas of the world. In fact, it was a long while before I could believe that anybody was saved who wasn't a Pentecostal, because I'd never met anybody saved that wasn't a Pentecostal. In order to enter the ministry, I laid on God's altar everything I had materially. I don't say this to boast, but I want to say it because of what I'm going to say later. I gave up my career at the university. I gave up my home country. I gave up my family. I gave up my fortune. I gave up everything. And I'm not boasting. I've never been sorry. I have never lacked. God has blessed me far more than I could have ever achieved by my own efforts. And I'm thankful for it. But I want you to know that I was a person that was absolutely committed to the full gospel message and full gospel people. We served, my wife and I served the Lord together in Palestine for a while. Then I was the pastor of a full gospel congregation in London, England for about eight or nine years. And then I spent five years in missionary service overseas with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada as a missionary in Kenya in East Africa and returned from the mission field in 1961, right at the end of 1961. And my wife being Danish, we went on our way back to Britain, we stopped off in Denmark. And round about Christmas of 1961, we were in the north of Denmark, in an area which the English-speaking people call Jutland, but the Danes call it something quite different. And we were staying with my wife's sister, and for a little while I was free from the obligations to preach and to minister. Now on the edge of the North Sea there, there is a cliff, which is a somewhat deserted spot, and I enjoyed going out there and praying and communing with the Lord and seeking God. And while I was out there one day, at this time, the Lord began to speak to me. Now I want you to understand, he did not speak to me with an audible voice. I have heard God speak to me once with a voice that I could hear. But in this occasion, he spoke very clearly and quietly, but very definitely to my mind. And I answered him in the same way. And this is something of what the Lord said. He reminded me of my past experiences. He said, you have uh, been a missionary in two countries. You have been a preacher here and a preacher there. You're the principal of a college. You're the member of a denomination. You have a pension scheme. And he went through the whole situation. And then he said, are you satisfied or do you want to go further? And this was quite a shock to me because I have to say that honestly I didn't think there was anything further. This may sound very conceited to you, but I wasn't deliberately conceited. I just didn't know of anything more that I needed to know because I was always a practical person. I didn't need to know all the future or exactly who the Antichrist would be. I needed to know the things that would help people. And I knew about salvation and the new birth. I knew about the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues. I knew about divine healing for the body. I'd preached these things and seen them work and knew that they were real. I preached the imminent return of the Lord and I believed in holiness of living. I was, I would say, a very orthodox Pentecostal preacher. And Pentecostal preachers are orthodox. They believe the Bible. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. Anything that was in the Bible, I accepted as authoritative. So when the Lord put this question to me, I was somewhat disconcerted. However, I knew that the Lord would not ask such a question if it did not have something to it. And I was not prepared to give him a hasty answer, because I've learned that when you say something to God, he takes you at your word. And in the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes, it says it's better to be slow and short with your words, because God is in heaven than you on earth. And there's a recording angel that keeps a record of everything that you say, and one day you're going to have to answer before the angel for what you've said. And the book of Ecclesiastes says at that time it'll be too late to say you didn't mean it. You, if you don't know that's in the Bible, I suggest you look at it. The first five verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it's a very important chapter. So I said, Lord, give me time and I'll come back with an answer. And I went away and I thought this thing over and turned it over in my mind. And about two or three days later, I went back to the same cliff and I got in touch with the Lord. said, I'm ready with my answer. And this is the answer I gave him. No. I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, I want to go further. That's what I said. If there is anything further, I want to go further. And when I said no, I'm not satisfied, for the first time I realized how dissatisfied I really was. You see, in the religious world, we can fool ourselves a long while. No one is worse than religious people for failing to face up to the truth. We take refuge in our religion and our religious platitudes and the opinions of others and what people have always said 
And we'd say, well, this must be it. There couldn't be any more. And I'm constantly meeting ministers in the same situation. They're grinding away at a grindstone, and they're saying, well, it's pretty tough going, and sometimes I long for something more, but there couldn't be more. This is the way it's always been. This is what we always do. We've always done it this way, and this is the only way there is to do it. And I really opened something up inside myself when I said, no, I'm not satisfied. Then I said, if there is anything further, I want to go further. And the Lord gave me a very clear, specific answer. And let me tell you that this is a personal answer for me, and it might not be the same to you. He said there are two conditions. First of all, all progress in the Christian life is by faith. If you are not willing to go forward in faith, you cannot go forward. Now that is absolutely scriptural. Secondly, he said, if you are to fulfill the ministry which I have for you, you will need a strong, healthy body, and you are putting on too much weight. And that was very true. I'd have reached a stage in life where your metabolism changes. And if you go on eating the same amount of food you ate before, it doesn't move out, it just clings on. And you know, we can be very blind about certain things. Other people see them, but we don't. And I've always been grateful to God for arresting me on that point. When I'm at home, I take my weight daily. And very, very rarely does it go up by more than two or three pounds from the limit that I feel is right for me. And I have proved in experience that God knew what he was saying, because the ministry into which God has since led me is an extremely exacting ministry, and it requires mental and physical fitness. And I believe that's a part of holiness. Well, I had made a commitment to God, and I did not know the nature of the commitment, and I was far from realizing the extent of the commitment. But... Actually, it changed the whole course of my life and ministry. At that time, I was expecting to spend a year on furlough and return as a missionary to East Africa. I expected to remain in the Fellowship of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, and I had no particular pressing reason for making any change. But within the next year, from that moment of commitment to God, the entire course of my life and ministry made a radical change. And it changed in ways that I could not have planned or organized or premeditated. And I realized that the change came as a result of my commitment. And if I'd never made that commitment, my ministry would never have been in the line in which it is today. As a result of this change, I came to the United States and took up residence here, a thing I had never planned or contemplated doing. And I am indeed grateful for the reception that I have received in the United States, for the kindness and the warmth and the hospitality. My wife and I at last decided that we would apply for American citizenship, this just recently. I'm just mentioning this in passing. My wife is Danish, and she changed from a Dane to becoming a Briton when she married me. And she's always said, well, if one change is enough, I'll never make another. So when I started to talk about this, she was far from enthusiastic. Well, she said, you can if you want to, but I won't. However, eventually we came to the point of agreement, and we sent in our application. Now the comical thing is, they've accepted her, but they haven't accepted me. <laughs> so April the 1st, the day after tomorrow, she's going to become an American citizen. And here am I, still lingering on with my British citizenship. Anyhow, that's just by the way. But I'd always thought to myself, if there is one country in the world which has enough preachers, it must be the United States. So they don't need me there. But the Lord brought us to the United States, my wife and myself and a little African baby girl that we had with us, in a way that we could never have planned. And in fact, I'm sure if we'd tried to immigrate, we couldn't have done it. But we got in by accident, and the immigration department arranged it all for us. And I must also say this, every time, the two occasions we've dealt with the immigration department, we've dealt with a born-again Christian. And that makes a great deal of difference. You need to pray for the people that administer your public services, because it matters who they are. The second time, this really shouldn't be on tape, but I might be all right. When we went to Miami to be interviewed and examined, and I had to tell the man the name of your first president and your present president, and I got them both right. Uh, he said, now, there are two things we're not supposed to talk about, religion and politics. And so he spent the rest of the time talking about religion. <laughs> He's a born-again Christian, a Presbyterian, teaches a Sunday school, and we had some real interesting discussion about the Bible. And I tell you, it makes a difference having real Christians in your public administration. Anyhow, I'm coming back to the, the uh, testimony I'm seeking to give. We found ourselves in the United States. We did not know exactly why we had come here, but the Lord began to lead us. And also, in the next year or two after that commitment, I realized that God had put me back in what I would call a kind of postgraduate course. I think that's not conceited. I could say that I was a spiritual graduate. But the Lord began to re-educate me. Now, he did not do this through a Bible school or through any human institution, but he did it by putting me in situations and circumstances where I came up with things that I 
had to turn to the Word to find the answer. And I realized that God planned this incident by incident. He spared no time, no trouble, and no expense. He would take me right across the continent back again just to show me one thing. And he opened up certain areas of the New Testament for me in a completely new way. I had read the New Testament doubtless hundreds of times. But after this commitment, I found that there were things in the New Testament I had never even dreamt were there. And I wondered how I could have read it so often and never seen them. In 1964, again under the leading of God, we were back in Denmark. And it was the month of October, a beautiful, fine fall afternoon. Now the Lord had spoken to us while we were praying together through the gifts of the Spirit, that is, through tongues and interpretation. My wife received the tongues and I received the interpretation. My wife and I pray regularly together when we're at home, morning and evening. And if we did not do that, we would not have the ministry we had. It's essential. And I don't believe any married couple should ever spend the day without praying together morning or evening. I don't believe you can have the unity and the harmony in your home which God intends you to have unless you follow that. And no one is worse than preachers for neglecting their homes, you know that? And the worst preachers are full gospel preachers. They'll save the whole world and leave their wife to get a nervous breakdown and their children to run off in rebellion. It's a sad thing, but there it is. And I've not been innocent in that respect myself in the past. In this particular tongues and interpretation, I heard myself saying, and I knew it was the Lord speaking to me, I will set thee on an eminent place and I will show thee what is going on in all the world. And I was scared. Do you know why? Because I've always been unwilling to accept any kind of revelation that exalts a human being. And I thought, what's this about being put on an eminent plate? It doesn't sound good to me. But yet I knew I had not chosen those words. And for the next few months, every time I went anywhere, I thought, now this is going to be it. And it never was. And then, about six months after this, or a little longer, as I say, we were back in Denmark, and without planning or premeditating, I was back there on the same cliff top where the Lord had spoken to me and challenged me. And in case I forget to say it, that was my eminent place. And it's very good English. It's a very exact description. So there was no exaltation of Brother Prince, you see. But I didn't understand it that way until later. And this was a fine autumn afternoon. The sun was shining on the waves of the North Sea. They were beating on the foot of the cliff about a hundred feet below me. And as I was standing there and meditating and looking out across them, the Lord again began to speak to me very, very, very definite. Now, I want you to understand it was not with an audible voice. And I want you to exercise your own judgment on what I tell you. Never accept somebody else's revelation unless the Holy Spirit makes it real to you. But as I looked out across the sea, the Lord began to speak to me about the history of the church. And he showed me that it was comparable to the behavior of the tides of the sea. And that the early church, the New Testament church, had corresponded to high tide. The water had been right up to the maximum. After that, in the subsequent centuries, the tide had gone out until it gone out to the lowest ebb, which was the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. Now the Lord showed me that the tide does not go out in one steady stream, but the waves still continue to follow one another, but each wave now does not reach so high as the previous wave. And in this way, gradually, the waves lose a large area that they once control. This is how the tide goes out. Then, tide turns and comes in again, and it comes in in the same way, not in one single steady stream, but in a series of waves following one another. But now, each wave comes a little higher than the previous wave. And in this way, gradually, the waves recover all that they had lost when the tide went out. The Lord showed me that the church was like this, that the early church had been high time, and after that there had been a recession. Gradually the church had lost most of the vital and precious truths which they once held. The Holy Spirit had continued to move in the church. There had been waves, but the waves had not reached so high as the preceding wave. And then the Lord showed me that round about the time of the Reformation, and I do not need to be precise, the tide had turned. And now there was a fresh moving of the Holy Spirit in the church, and the waves were coming higher than the previous wave. And each new wave was recovering a little more of what had been lost from the truth of the early church. And in my mind, the Lord reminded me of certain great waves, as, for instance, the Reformation and the Wesleyan Revival and the movement under Charles Finney and in about the 1850s here in the United States and the Welsh Revival in 1904 and so on. The Lord showed me or reminded me also that some waves are greater than other waves. I think about every seventh wave is usually a great wave. The Lord also showed me that once a wave has reached its maximum, checks, remains stationary for a moment or two, and then withdraws. 
<coughs> and that the sa- same wave never comes back again. And he showed me that this was true in the church. When a revival, a move of the Holy Spirit, has accomplished its purpose and reached its maximum, it checks, holds a moment or two, and withdraws. And that God never revives a revival. He never warms something up. Most of the movements in the church have become monuments, and God doesn't revive a monument. As I say, the Lord took me through, in outline, the history of the church up to the Pentecostal movement. And he showed me that the Pentecostal movement had been one of the great waves in church history, that it had made an impact all around the world, that it had recovered areas of truth which no previous movement had recovered, particularly the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a distinct experience from salvation evidenced by speaking with a new tongue, the provision of physical healing for the body of the believer in the atonement of Jesus Christ, and so on. And then the Lord showed me, and he showed it to me as clearly as I can see your faces now, that the Pentecostal movement had reached its maximum, checked, and was withdrawing. It was receding. And then he showed me that when the Pentecostal movement had receded a certain distance, a new wave would come, and that it would be a greater wave than any that had gone before it, and it would be the last wave. And this, I'm not seeking to convince anybody, but I could not be unconvinced myself. As far as I'm concerned, I know it. Well, at this point, I felt discouraged, because as I say, my wife and I both had committed our entire lives to the Pentecostal movement. And we were pretty fanatical Pentecostal. We didn't believe you had any business belonging to anything but a Pentecostal church. And we thought that when God began to pour out his spirit on Episcopalians and Presbyterians, people like that, he was making a rather serious mistake. Mm. Well, now, when the Lord showed me this, I thought to myself, well, what does this mean for me? Because uh, I don't want to be in a wave that's going on. That's not my ambition. And I thought to myself, well, what will I do? The same wave never comes back. And at that point, the Lord showed me the answer. And I, no, there's no extra charge, I'll pass it on to you. The Lord showed me the same wave never comes back, but some of the water that was in the previous wave can come back in the next one. So I said, Lord, that's my decision right now. I'm coming back in the next wave. And I believe that. I believe that. And I believe what we are seeing right across the United States. More than 1,000 Roman Catholics being baptized in the Holy Spirit each month, and many, many other things, which I will not seek to go into into detail tonight, is the beginning of the new way. It's only the beginning, but it's a good beginning. Things have happened in the last five years I would not have believed I would ever witness if anybody told me. Now, what I want to speak to you about tonight with this background is one particular area of truth that the Lord gave me a postgraduate course in. And I did not enroll for this course. I just found myself involved in it. And the course was in dealing with evil spirits. So I'm going to spend the rest of this evening telling you how I got involved in this. Personally, I don't believe there are any experts in the church. You know what they say an expert is? A man away from home with a briefcase. And that's what I normally am. But believe me, I'm not an expert. Furthermore, I don't believe there should be any specialists in the church. Well, if you want healing, you go to Brother So-and-so. If you want deliverance, you go to Brother So-and-so. And if you want something else, you go to Brother So-and-so. That isn't my idea of the gospel. The gospel is one complete message. And every preacher of the gospel should preach the gospel. That's all. Now, being Pentecostal, I'd always believed in the reality of evil spirits. You can't believe the Bible without believing that. And I'd always believed that was part of the full gospel ministry to get rid of evil spirits. But I'd never had very much to do with it. Now, looking back, I realized that I had more to do with it than I understood, because sometimes I'd been confronted with them without realizing what they were. In fact, the first person I ever confronted evil spirits in was myself. And the first deliverance service I ever had was when God saved me in an army barrack room. And if anybody else had been there, they wouldn't have understood what was going on. But I realized, looking back, that a great many different demons were being driven out of me particularly the cult demons, the yoga demons, the Buddhist demons, and all these, which were the ones that really stood between me and Jesus Christ when I wanted to find him. And then, in the course of time, especially in Africa, I had come to situations where it was perfectly clear that I was not dealing with a human personality. There was something else there, and I would do my best. Like most preachers, I acted as demons were deaf, and the louder you shout, the more results you'll get. Well, that's not true. Let me tell you, that that doesn't work. I also had a friend, a very wonderful African evangelist, who told me about ministering to people, African women that couldn't read or write any language and only spoke their own language, and that the evil spirits out of these women would challenge him in English. Now, I knew he was a man of truth. I didn't question it, but I'd never been there when it happened. Also, looking back now, I realize 
that in many cases, all too many cases, people had come to me with desperate needs for help and I had not been able to meet their needs because I refused to recognize the true cause. Um, and one reason why I did was because I was, I was under a Pentecostal delusion. Maybe that's not a kind word. I had accepted a Pentecostal tradition. You see, when I stepped out of the Anglican Church, I thought I'd given up all my traditions. I discovered many years later I hadn't. Pretty hard to give up all your traditions. And when I stepped into the Pentecostal movement, I thought, well, these people have been right about everything that I've discovered, so they're right. So I believed everything they believed. Well, Pentecostal people have their traditions too. I discovered that later. One of the traditions that I had discovered in the Pentecostal movement, it isn't in every section of the Pentecostal movement, was this, that you, once you are saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and have spoken in tongues, you cannot need deliverance from an evil spirit. Now, I can look back on people who came to me who manifestly did need deliverance from evil spirits. But because I knew they were saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I had heard them speak in tongues, I refused to acknowledge that that was their need. I think of one outstanding case, which I shall remember with regret all my life, of a Jewish man who was born in Germany, came to London, and found Christ. Now, if this man were to come to me today and tell me his story, he wouldn't need to tell me more than five sentences Well, I would immediately suspect that he needed deliverance because of his background. He was the second of two brothers born into a German-Jewish family, and his mother wanted a girl and was disappointed all her life that he was a boy. So, for about the first 12 years of his life, she brought him up as far as possible to look like a girl, dressed him like a girl, had his hair like a girl, and so on. Then, under Hitler, the whole family perished in Hitler's gas chambers with the exception of the two boys. The elder boy became an atheist, and this one came to Britain and found Christ. But with a background like that today, no matter what experience he might have had along the way, I would anticipate his needing deliverance. It would be exceptional if he didn't. And he would come to me at times and say, can't you get this devil out of me? And I would say, no, you, you can't have a devil. Because I, I'd been there when he spoke in tongues, spoke a beautiful language clearly and fluently, and it was not German, for I know the German language. And I'll give you an example of, of how blind a person can be. He told me these two things about himself. He said in order to punish himself, he would put his fingers in the door and slam the door on his own fingers. And worse than that, now forgive me for being frank, he would even feel compelled to drink his own urine. Well, I mean, such a person, if they went to a psychiatrist, they would immediately begin to diagnose things. But nevertheless, I could not accept the fact that there was a devil in him. And even if there had been, I probably wouldn't have known how to get it out. Eventually, he went to a neurosurgeon who performed an operation that severed something in the lobes of the brain and physically relieved the pressure, but left him about three quarters of a person. And I would have to say there was a failure on my part to minister to the need of someone that came to me for help that I should have been able to give him. I think of another man, a young man that was saved in a street meeting when I was preaching, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and became one of the keenest workers that worked with us for about eight years. He was a dedicated, devoted Christian, a zealous witness and soul winner, but he had an inconquerable problem with lust. Uh, he served God in spite of it. He remained true to the law. But this would plunge him into moments of defeat and despair. And he'd come to my wife and me and say, pray for me. And some nights we'd pray three hours with him. And he said sometimes, now don't stop praying. It's leaving me. It's leaving me. I can feel it going out of my fingers. But that didn't make sense to me. And I know that many times we were maybe within five minutes of getting him delivered, but we never did it because we didn't know what we were dealing with. Like Paul said, I was like a man beating the air. I was like a blindfolded boxer in a ring fighting an opponent who could see, and I couldn't see where I was landing my blows. Now, I could mention many, many other cases, but I just mentioned those two as examples where I was blinded by a doctrinal preconception, seeing the truth and acting on it. Now, I must tell you that I have never heard a Pentecostal preacher preach a sermon out of the word proving that a person baptized in the Holy Spirit can never need deliverance from an evil spirit. And I don't believe such a sermon can be preached. Because I don't believe the word teaches that. People say, where is the scripture that says a Christian can have an evil spirit? I tell, I tell you where to find it. Immediately after the scripture that says a Christian cannot have an evil spirit. Find that one first. You won't find either of them. See, the Bible doesn't speak in those terms. The Bible only uses the word Christian three times in the New Testament. In none of those passages is there any commitment one way or the other about a Christian having an evil spirit. Well, now I'll describe the process of education that the Lord put me through. I... 
1963, became the pastor of an independent Pentecostal church in Seattle, Washington. I took the church over in a rather disastrous situation, and I learned the meaning of one scripture, which is Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Did you know that Pentecostal Christians could be bewitched? You read the next verse. This only what I know of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. They had received the Holy Spirit but they were bewitched. Does that fit in with your theology? Well, I found it by experience. That congregation I took over was small, defeated, and it was bewitched, almost to a person. And you know who had bewitched them? The wife of the previous pastor. Let me tell you about her. This had been a very flourishing church, a very, very flourishing church. But the pastor's wife became interested in counseling at length with men, which I think is a very dangerous thing, either for men to do with ladies or ladies to do with men. And I never sit alone for any length of time with any woman unless my wife or some other suitable person is there. And in, eventually she came to the place where she decided to divorce her husband and marry one of the board members. And this board member divorced his wife and they got married. Now this was a very flagrant and obvious case of going against the word of God, and yet this woman, the pastor's wife, had such a power over that congregation that they wouldn't peep or mutter. She had them absolutely under her thumb. Once and once only I met that woman and looked into her eyes, and it was like looking into the pools of hell. If my wife and I were not pretty strong persons, we'd have never come through that. It was one of the most tremendous spiritual conflicts I've been through. And if I had not realized what was wrong with that congregation, I couldn't have helped them. But they were bewitched. The literal meaning of the Greek word is, Who hath smitten you with the eye? Smitten with the evil eye. And I met several Christians that said, I don't dare to look that woman in the eye. Then while I was still struggling with this situation, but gradually coming out on top, one Saturday morning, quite early, I received a phone call from a Baptist minister whom I knew, who had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the gist of what he said was this. He said, I have a woman here, a Baptist woman, who needs deliverance from evil spirits. And the Lord has shown me that you and your wife are to be the instruments of deliverance, and it's to happen today. Well, I, at that time, I wasn't used to getting phone calls like that from Baptist ministers. And I, I thought to myself, now, what about it? And I'm not prepared to let anybody dictate to me with their private revelation for me. So I kind of sent a quick telegram up to the Lord and said, Lord, what about it? And the Lord seemed to say, this is it, it's right. So I said, all right, brother, come along, bring the lady. Well, while we were waiting for the pastor and the lady to arrive, a Presbyterian couple whom we knew in Seattle who had the bats in the Holy Spirit came in to visit us and we told them what was happening and they said, we'll stay. So the pastor and the lady arrived a little later and there we were, my wife and myself, the pastor and the Baptist lady and this Presbyterian couple. And we remained there with that woman for more than five hours. Now, when this man came with his statement about this lady needing deliverance, I was skeptical, but I did not reject it. I said to myself, I'll just see what happened. Now, this lady had been the secretary of a Baptist church, had professed faith in Jesus Christ as a savior, had been baptized by immersion, and had gone to a well-known Episcopal mission church in Seattle, Washington, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues. This, I was told. She was about 40 years old, and to me, she looked an ordinary American housewife. The Baptist pastor planted her down in one of our chairs, and he said this. He said, she's already been delivered from the demon of nicotine, but there are others. And I sat sideways on and viewed the situation with objective detachment. And then he proceeded to stir the devil up in the woman. That's the only way I can say it. He stood in front of her and challenged Satan. And as I say, like most people, he was under the impression that the devil is deaf and you've got to shout at him. So he stood there in front of the woman and shouted at the devil. And I watched. And I was certainly not committed one way or the other. But after a while, I saw very, very clearly a change come over the woman. Her features changed. They twisted wasn't like looking at the same person. And the particular thing I will never forget is a kind of bright yellow sulfurous glare appeared right in the center of both her eyes. And I knew without a question that somehow we had come in contact with a personality that was not the personality of the woman. Well, my friend the pastor went on for a while and didn't seem to be getting anywhere. And I'm one of those people that always takes somebody else to stir me up and get me moving. So I thought, well, if he can do it, I can. So 
And I had a certain experience. Now, I forgot to mention one experience that we'd had in London way back. Let me just take a moment to tell you this, because it had a little bearing on it. Way back in London, I had been asked to go and pray for a Eurasian boy, half European, half Indian, by his mother. The boy was retarded. He was 16 years old. He could hardly speak. He sat there more or less like a, a vegetable. And my wife and I went along, taking with us two Russian Jewish sisters whom we knew and who were friends of us. So we arrived there, myself speaking English, my wife speaking Danish as her mother tongue, and the two sisters speaking Russian as their mother tongue. And we went through the process of standing around this boy and shouting at him for a long while without any result. And then I thought to myself, well, this is getting us nowhere. So I stood up in front of the boy and I said this. I said, now you evil spirit that's in this boy, I'm talking to you and not to the boy, is Jesus Lord. And out of the boy's lips came two words, nigh and yet. And nigh is the Danish for no, and yet is the Russian for no. So there was something in that boy who couldn't even speak English that could speak both Danish and Russian and knew that my wife understood Danish and that the two sisters understood Russian. So there was a particular occasion where I knew I'd come up against something that was not a boy but that was in the boy. And I remembered that I'd done it by saying, now you spirit that's in this boy, I'm speaking to you and not to the boy, and in the name of Jesus Christ... I command you to answer me. Now, nothing further ever happened with that boy. He did not get delivered, and I discovered later that his mother in India had taken him to the witch doctor and the necromancer and all these things for help, and of course, in those circumstances, deliverance was really out of the question. However, this came back to my mind, so now with this Baptist woman in our chair in our living room and the Baptist pastor beginning to get a little tired, I thought, I'll do it. So I stepped in front of the lady and I said, Now, you evil spirit that's in this woman, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman, and I command you to answer me. What is your name? And out of her mouth came one single word, hate, and her whole face registered pure, unadulterated hatred. So I realized then that I was in contact with this demon and that it was a demon of hate. So I said the obvious thing to say was, well, come out of her. Now, I want to tell you that in what happened next, I'm not claiming that I did the right thing, but I'm just telling you what I did. And I'll tell you, my basic motivation was this. Whatever the devil said, I was going to deny it. Whatever he declared, I would declare the opposite. I was not going to let him have the last word. So I said, now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of this woman. And a sneering voice that was quite unlike the woman's voice said, I'm not coming out of this woman. This is my house. I've lived here 35 years and I'm not coming out. The woman was about 40 years old. So I began to argue this point with the demon. I told it it was coming out. And this was like a psychological warfare. You had to beat this thing down phase by phase. So after a while, and with the use of the name of Jesus and scripture, I got to the place where it said, well, if I come out, come back. So I said, no, you come out and you stay out. And we beat one another on this. So I got it to the next phase. Well, even if I come out, my brothers are here and they'll kill her. Now, I didn't know anything about his brothers, but as I say, I was just determined that whatever he said, I'd say something different. So I said, no, you'll come out first and your brothers will come out after you. And we argued that one. I mean, this was exhausting. It it took all my physical and mental energy to do this. We argued this one through and then it said, well, even if we come out of the woman, we've got her daughter and we'll kill her. Well, I didn't know the woman had a daughter. I said, no, you'll come out of the woman first and you'll come out of the daughter afterwards. Well, at this point, it changed its tactics and the woman's arms rose up to her own throat and she began to throttle herself with her own arm, hand. And I mean, this was not a play, it was happening. Her face was going purple and her eyes were popping out of her hand. And this Presbyterian brother and I, we got up and we took hold of one arm and it took our united strength to get her arms away from her throat and she was a comparatively frail woman. And he was a good deal heavier and heavier and taller than I am. We were definitely dealing with a strength in that woman that was not her own strength at all. Well, after this, I returned to the battle and I was conscious all this time of what I would call the area of the spirit in me opposing this spirit. There was a tremendous pressure and counter pressure that I could actually feel within my body. And then something happened. There was a kind of hissing noise and the woman's body became limp and her head limp, limply fell forward and the pressure inside me lifted and I knew this demon had gone out. But I was... I only had to look at her a few moments more to see something else come to the surface. And I realized it still was not the woman. So I went through the same procedure with the next one. It named itself. 
and we had an argument, and it came off. Now, I'm not going to go into details, but I'll tell you that this process took five hours of unrelenting spiritual conflict. I, if I remember correctly, there were eight distinct spirits that named themselves and came out. I'm not sure that I can remember them all, but I remember some of them. The next one was fear, then envy, then pride, then self-pity, and that was a revelation to me. I'd never known there was a demon of self-pity, and how useful that information has been ever since. The next one named itself as infidelity, and I didn't understand that, although I do today. And still, it was clear that there was not complete deliverance. Now, I'm telling you this very briefly, but... We got a glimpse of the unseen world that was quite astonishing. For instance, these demons knew about the Baptist preachers in the city of Seattle, and they told us what they preached, and what they believed, and a great many other things. And more or less, in effect, how they could fool them. So we came to the point where I still knew there was something else, and I said, what is your name? And the answer came, death. And all this time, I was so grateful that I had a knowledge of the word. I would not depart from the word. And immediately I thought to myself, the sixth chapter of Revelation, John saw a horse, and the rider on him was called death. So death is not just a condition, it's a person. And I said to this spirit of death, when did you enter into this woman? And it answered, three and a half years ago, when she nearly died on the operating table. And I must tell you now that since then, I've used that information many times. See, the spirit of death, I'm, I'm going up beyond what I knew then. The spirit of death comes in, in moments of physical or nervous weakness, to kill a person who would not die of natural causes. And I have dealt with this spirit in many people since. And it usually comes in, in something like an operation, or a serious illness, or an emotional crisis. And I've come to recognize it. I recognize it, and it recognizes me. Well, I still use the same tactics on this spirit, and it took maybe an hour to get this last one out. And when it eventually came out, the woman's face was precisely like a death mark. There was no trace of life in her at all. She was stretched out on her back on the floor, and anybody walking in would have said instantly there was a dead woman on the floor. And again, I remembered how in a certain case, when Jesus cast the spirit out, people said he's dead. She lay there for about ten minutes like this, then put her arms up in the air and began to praise the Lord. And I had the impression that she was delivered. Now, had I known then what I know now, I would have realized immediately that a woman that had been through that much would not have a deliverance that would go unchallenged by Satan. She would have to be instructed and counseled and taught how to prepare herself for counterattacks and so on. And maybe clear out her life and maybe her home and many things. But at that time, I didn't realize these things. Anyhow, it wasn't but a few days before she phoned us and said, I'm having trouble and I think some of them are trying to come back. Would you come out and see me? So my wife and I drove out to her home and saw her, and her youngest little girl, she had three children, was with her. A little child of six, thin, miserable, shy, and what I noticed particularly was this little child would never look you in the eyes. If you looked at it, it immediately averted its eyes. And after a while, I said to the woman, I know the devil is a liar, and you can't count on him to tell the truth, but I cannot help feeling that when those demons said they had your daughter, they were telling the truth. I think your daughter has the same problems that you have. Incidentally, the child was graded retarded at school. So she said, well, I want you to pray for my daughter. So exactly one week later, the next Saturday, she brought the daughter. The Presbyterian couple, my wife and I, and one other lady were there. The Baptist pastor was not there this second time. And we went through about three hours of the same with this little girl of six. We commanded the spirits to name themselves. They named themselves, spoke out of her. And when they spoke, I turned to the mother and I said, Is that your daughter's voice you're listening to? She said, It isn't even like my daughter's voice. And several of the same spirits that were in the mother were in the daughter, particularly hate, first one. And the last one to come out of the little girl was death. And it came out in exactly the same way as it came out of the mother. You would have said when the process was finished, there was a little dead girl lying on the floor. Now, I have never been able fully to check up on that case, but I was back there about two years later, and I inquired about the little girl, and she was at school doing better and was no longer graded retarded. She was making normal grades. Now, this introduction finally showed me, I would say, the nature of the spiritual realm. It showed me that what Jesus was doing all through the Gospels in casting evil spirits out of people was a reality that was accurately described, there was no distortion, it was precisely the way it was, and that people and demons have not changed. Exactly the same needs exist today and have to be dealt with in exactly the same way. Now, I went back to my congregation, and I looked at them, and immediately I saw them different. I began to see the real nature of their needs and problems. Now, let me interpose this. 
last year I was preaching in an assembly of God on the west coast. And the past, it's a very successful assembly of God. It has something like a thousand Sunday morning worship and so on. And the pastor said to me, Brother Prince, you've come here by divine appointment. He said, I have told God that I'm never going to have in this church another, quote, revival, unquote. And he said this, this may seem shocking to you, but I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, as I look out over my congregation, he said, I see demons and they scare me. And he said, I've prayed for somebody to come and show me what to do about it. And he said, you're the answer to that prayer. And indeed, in the next five days, that congregation was turned about upside down and inside out. And his diagnosis was verified scores of times over. Well, I looked at my congregation and I could see now that most pastors know that people behave in strange ways which you can't explain. And you can counsel with them, and you can preach at them, and you can do everything with them, but it just doesn't change the fact they don't act the way they should. And there's no real logical explanation. Now, I did a foolish thing. I began to give hints. And I'll tell you, preaching is... The hint, giving hints is useless for a preacher. You call a spade a spade and not an agricultural implement. I'll tell you what happens if you give hints. The wrong people always take them. You've got a rather noisy, boisterous sister in the congregation and you begin hinting about people that could be a little quieter. She doesn't hear, but there's a little mousy sister that never did yap, yap or open her mouth and from then on she's silenced forever. So God showed me, if you've got something to tell an individual, tell it to the individual, not the congregation. And if you've got to say something, say it plainly. Don't hint at it. But I began to hint. And I could see my good Pentecostal congregation sitting back with their arms folded, smiling indulgently, saying to themselves, our pastor's got to be in his bonnet. But I had helped them, and they were grateful to me, and they were precious and wonderful people, and so they were prepared to put up with it until it passed over. And who knows what would have happened if God and the devil had not intervened simultaneously. But about a month later, uh, I was preaching in the morning worship service. A beautifully well-ordered 11 o'clock morning worship service. And there was a lady that drove 20 miles every Sunday morning to play the piano. Now this lady was a test case, and when God wants a test case, he can provide it. Her father was a Pentecostal preacher, her mother was a Pentecostal woman and a saintly woman. She had grown up in Pentecost, in salvation, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Her husband was a student at the Pentecostal Bible College, and her husband's brother was a minister. So here was a real case. And I knew nothing about it, absolutely nothing. So in this particular, now, this sermon happens to be recorded on tape. I didn't know it at the time, and you can purchase it. It's on one of them, in the white catalog, one of the messages. I'm not saying it's a particularly good message, but objectively, you can check on what I'm telling you. I took as my text Isaiah 59:19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And my theme was, no matter what the devil may do, God has always got the answer and the last word. And I know myself from my own preaching, and I realize now that I was getting out of myself. The Holy Spirit was lifting me onto a higher plane, and even my voice began to change. It was fascinating listening to that tape six months later, knowing what was going to happen, and finding that the Holy Spirit knew it before I knew it, and was getting me ready. And I waxed unusually bold, and I began to say, like this, Egypt had his, its, its, its magicians, but God had his Moses. Baal had his prophets, but God had his Elijah. And then there came a revelation to me. I said, when God wanted to show Abraham what his seed would be, he took him out on a dark night, pointed to the stars, and said, so shall thy seed be. And I said, we are the seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. When other lights are shining in the heaven, you don't see the star. But when every other light has gone out, then the stars shine the brightest. And I said, at the close of this age, that's how it will be. Every other source of light will vanish, and the true Christians will shine the brightest when the world is the darkest. Now, it's very interesting to know the message that the devil doesn't like. And I'll tell you the message, number one on his list of messages he doesn't want preached, is just that. The message he opposes more than any other is the truth of what the church can and should be, and what the church can and should do to the devil. He fights that truth more than any other. And it appears that he could not bear this any longer. And just as I reached this point in my message, this young lady that played the piano, young married woman, was sitting alone on the front pew on my left. And at this point, she let out the most blood-curdling, prolonged shriek that you've ever heard. And this is recorded on the tape, so I don't have to exaggerate. I don't believe any human being could keep up a shriek that loud that long. Her arms went up in the air, and she slid off the seat onto the floor and lay there writhing in a very unladylike position. And there I was. I preached myself into position from which I either had, I either had to prove it or shut up. That was all. There was just nothing else. I hadn't premeditated. 
Somebody told me afterwards, the lady in the congregation said, Brother Prince, the, the normal thing to do in that situation is to say, our sister isn't feeling well, will one of the deacons take her down to the basement? <laughs> but I, it didn't even enter my head to do that. I stopped and I said, our sister needs prayer. And then I thought, I need help. <laughs> I thought, who can help me? And I knew my wife was there and I could count on her, thank God. And I looked out and uh, Forgive me, and I hope everybody will forgive me. I looked at my good, sweet, lovely Pentecostal congregation, and there wasn't one of them that could say boo to a dean. But there was the Presbyterian couple way back, and I knew I could rely on them, because they'd been battle-tried. So I said, well, brother and sister so-and-so, come forward. Down they came. So the four of us stood around this woman. Now, this Presbyterian lady, when it came to the demons, she was like a terrier after rats. She didn't wait for anybody. She started jumping up and down and saying, Now, you demon, what is your name? What is your name? And out of the woman's voice would come a deep, harsh, gruff, masculine-sounding voice. My name is... But it wouldn't say any more. So I thought again, you see, this is always the way it happens to me. Well, if she can do it, I can. And really, I ought to be doing it. So I got in front of the woman and I said, Now, you evil spirit that's in this woman, I'm talking to you and not to the woman. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to answer me. What is your name? And it said, my name is... And it didn't say anymore. So then I said, you've got to answer me. The Bible says you're subject unto me through the name of Jesus. And we argued this on the basis of the word of God for a few minutes. And suddenly, out of this woman's voice came a loud roar. My name is Lies! And you could have heard it outside the church. And everybody went up and down with bang on their feet. And again, I thought to myself, now this is scriptural. First Kings chapter 22, God put a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. This is all right. So I said, now you lying spirit, in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman. And then we had about ten minutes of the most sustained conflict you can imagine. I understand why the Apostle Paul speaks about wrestling. It was like wrestling. Physical, mental, spiritual. And then after about ten minutes we beat this thing down and her woman's mouth opened and her tongue protruded uh, something like an inch, I would say. And it was blue and twisting like a snake. And then this loud roar that went on and on and on. And as it died down, the spirit left and the woman collapsed like an emptied sack on the floor. Well, I was so grateful that the Lord had given me a little private practice before this happened in public. Because otherwise I could easily have said, well, now the woman's been delivered. I knew immediately that there was much more than that. But I thought that's enough for the morning worship service. <laughs> so I said, uh, no, I think my wife will take our sister into the office and uh, I'll go on with my sermon. So my wife and the Presbyterian brother and the church treasurer, who was also a pretty stalwart individual, led the woman off into the office. And I went back, but really it didn't matter what I preached about because <laughs> they were overwhelmed. I'm telling you, I had a s just rows of open mouths and open eyes staring at me. And anyhow, I couldn't get very far because the office was just behind the platform on the left and dull thuds started to come out of the office. And then my wife, and if you know her, she's not given to emotionalism, she put her head around the corner and she said, you better come in here quickly. So I said, well, I'll dismiss the service. You can either stay in the church and pray or you can go home, do whatever you wish. Now, as I was turning to go into the office, the mother of the girl came up to me. Her parents were in the church. And I, I was telling you, she's a saintly, godly woman. She said to me, Mr. Prince, was that our daughter? And you know, it, it shocked me. I thought, could that have been their daughter? She looked so different. I couldn't, I didn't dare to say yes or no. Well, I said, I think it must have been, because there was no one else sitting on that seat but your daughter. But you see, the woman had changed so completely that I really couldn't, even for a moment, say yes, it was your daughter. So the father and mother came in with me into the office, and then the husband came in. And there we were, a group of people in the office. Now, the, the woman was being held by both arms by the church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother, and she was shaking them around like a couple of rats. And every time she got a hand free, she was pulling her clothes off. So I thought to myself, now this is where Pentecostal preachers make their big mistakes. And I said to the family, I said, now if you would like to take this young lady to a psychiatrist, you're very welcome to do so. But I will not seek to help her any further unless you all indicate that it is your will that I do so. And they all immediately said, Brother Prince, we would like you to help her. Well then I said, in that case, I think everybody who is not a member of the family, except my wife and myself, should go out of the room. And so we were left. Then I was prepared to start praying for the girl again, but immediately I felt somehow that something else had to be done first. And the girl's mother began to say to me, You know, Brother Prince, we've been trying to make an appointment for you, with you for several days for counseling with our daughter because we knew that something was going seriously wrong, but we didn't know what it was. 
And it was in the marriage relationship between this woman and her husband. And I cannot in this present company go into details, but this woman, the mother, was a trained nurse, and she could say things in a way that other people couldn't have expressed them in public. And she indicated that something very perverse had developed between, in the relationship between this young married woman and her husband. And then it came out that this young married woman had developed an infatuation for her husband, for her husband's brother and that she'd begun to write letters to this man who was a minister, and that the letters could be innocent or they could have a kind of second meaning to them. And then it came out she had one of these letters to her brother-in-law in her purse at that time. Well, I said, this is a sinful relationship, and if you will not completely renounce it, I will not pray for you. And furthermore, if you will renounce it, I demand that you take that letter out of your purse, give it to me, and I'll tear it up in front of you. Well, it took about 10 or 15 minutes to convince this woman that she had to give up this relationship. And then she did, and opened her purse, and gave me this letter, and I tore it up and dropped it in the waste paper. Then I felt I could start to pray for her again. Now, as it was a woman, I would have been happy if my wife had prayed for her. My wife has a real ministry of praying for people. But somehow the Lord showed me it was my responsibility. I put my hand on her back, and as soon as I began to pray, she slumped to the floor. And then again, by no process of natural reasoning, the Lord showed me that she was so under the power of Satan that there was only one position of her body in which she could be delivered. And that was by putting her head forward between her knees. So I got down on the floor beside her, put my hand on the small of her back, and pressed her body forward until she was, had her head between her knees. Then I began to rebuke these evil spirits, and they began to come out quickly, one after another, naming themselves, which I did not command them to do, and the names were nearly all sexual, and some of them obscene. And this may sound fantastic, but as they came out of her body, I could count them, passing the palm of my hand. I could just feel each one as it passed. It was almost like a kind of counter. Now this went on till about two o'clock in the afternoon, from about, say, 11.45, two hours or more. At that time, the woman was physically totally exhausted, and she just lay back on her back on the floor, but she was not like a dead person, she was just completely exhausted. After about ten minutes, she put her arms up in the air and began to praise Jesus for deliverance. As far as I know, she was delivered. Now I want to tell you the aftermath of that, because it's rather tragic in a way, and yet it's so typical. That young woman never came back to that congregation. She could not face meeting all those people. And I understand her feeling, but to me today, this is the most terrible condemnation of Christianity as a whole. We've got the church so respectable, so dignified, that we're not in a position to help the people that really need help. And most of the people that really need help are too embarrassed to come to us, because they don't fit in in that respectable social, middle-class atmosphere. Well, from then on, my wife and I have never had to go out for customers. I don't know what happened, but there was a, just a breakthrough. And we were simply swamped with people coming to us for deliverance. How they found out where we were, I don't know. Most of them did not come to the church. They came to our home. And night after night after night, we would sit up till midnight and 2 a.m., counseling and praying with people. And in that way, my physical strength began to be broken down. And I was in serious danger of needing deliverance myself. And I want to say this, I have learned it's a snare of the devil to get our physical strength broken down. And it is dangerous to be in this ministry if you're tired or irritable or out of sorts. Do not even try to help people because you will not help them but you'll get injured yourself. Well, after a while, I began to see that this was not a satisfactory way of helping people. Now, I'm going to go rather briefly, but I'm going to try to bring you up to the place where we can take on tomorrow night and I will preach rather than testify on this subject with the deliberate intention of ministering to people that have needs. I began to see that this was too consuming of time and strength. I began to see that for people to get deliverance, one thing that was essential was that they receive proper, thorough instruction in the Word of God. And that to give a person the proper instruction would take about an hour or more. Then to minister and pray with them would take at least half an hour one way or another. So every case would take maybe an hour and a half as a minimum. If you had 30 cases a week, it would take you 45 hours, which is about what the pet world today calls a working week. And yet we were not even beginning to scratch at the surface of the total need. Furthermore, I began to feel that people were treating me rather like a psychiatrist. And I want to tell you one thing, by profession and training I am no psychiatrist, and this is not psychiatry that I am speaking about. 
I'm not criticizing psychiatrists, but I'm just making clear this is the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I minister on the basis of the word. I demand that people make a surrender to Jesus Christ, and if they will not do that, I have nothing to offer them. A psychiatrist will minister to a Buddhist, a communist, a Confucianist, or a total atheist, on basic psychological principles. I minister on spiritual principles that have their basis solely in the Word of God. It's totally different. After a while, I found myself getting involved in ministering to people en masse. This didn't exactly happen by plan, it happened by accident. And one of the critical points was when I was the Bible teacher at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International in Chicago in 1965. And I was given the privilege of teaching the Bible five afternoons in succession. And I always like to work through a thing systematically if I can. So I took a series of messages on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the old Adamic nature and the cross, and then the fourth message, if I remember rightly, was on evil spirit and the need of deliverance. And I tried to distinguish between how we deal with the old Adamic nature through the cross and how we deal with evil spirits by deliverance. At that afternoon session, there were about 600 persons present. And at the end, I asked how many people here, on the basis of what I have said this afternoon, feel that you need deliverance. And immediately, at one appeal, about 200 people raised their hand. So I found myself with 200 people standing in front of me saying they needed deliverance. And it was obvious that I could not in any circumstances minister to them individually. So I said, I will lead you in a prayer in which you yourself renounce deliverance, come to Jesus as your deliverer, and meet the conditions for deliverance, and claim your own deliverance. And I did. And a brother in the Lord that made a tape of that subsequently took the prayer out of that tape and printed it. And I, I cannot but say that I know I was inspired by the Holy Spirit. When I read that prayer, I'm literally astonished. It's almost like a poem. Now, the results were in a certain sense chaotic. Uh, and this happened, unfortunately, in Conrad Hilton Hotel. I can well understand that there was a somewhat negative reaction in some circles that are not unknown to me. And I'm not saying that the reaction was wrong. I'm just saying that the whole thing happened in a way that I really couldn't do much about. We had the two epileptics rising on the floor, fro frothing at the mouth. We had women screaming and swooning and I don't know what else. But wherever I go in America, somebody comes up to me and says, Brother Prince, you remember that service? Well, I got delivered. So that's my reward. Uh, the next day... We had just a period of question and answer, and it was quite general, it went on various things. And then I said, let's have a little time of prayer at the end. And when we began to pray, this was still in the Conrad Hilton Hotel, I saw a woman, and I discovered later she was in Puerto Rico, sitting on a chair and writhing and hissing like a snake. So I thought, this couldn't be right. I walked over to her and began to pray, and this thing looked at me just like a snake and hissed at me, and I was wondering what to do with it. Now I've learned something, I'll tell you this, Satan comes to the help of Satan. This woman was pro presumably a spiritist or a medium, and she was one of Satan's servants, and he was out to divert my attention. So over on the other side of the room, a young woman began to scream, I mean the most piercing scream. And I thought to myself, now this really isn't the right thing for the Conrad Hilton Hotel, so I went over to the young woman, who was a registered nurse of British background, had come to the United States through Canada, was the member of a Pentecostal congregation in Chicago and had been brought by the wife of the minister who knew that this woman had a problem but did not know what it was. And as soon as I got up to this young woman, and I know her well, she's a friend of ours today, these spirits started to speak out of, speak to me out of her. I didn't ask them to. The first one said, I'm a sorcerer. Well, I said, you demon of sorcery, come out of this woman. And after some considerable struggle, it came out. The next one said, I'm witchcraft. Well, I said, you demon of witchcraft, come out of this woman. And when this happened, she looked and acted like a witch. Then it got very angry with me and said she was going to be a medium. Well, I said, she isn't going to be a medium now. Now, I'll tell you this because it was really one of the most remarkable cases I've encountered, and I'll take a little while to describe it. And uh, uh, at least ten or a dozen people all the time were witnesses. Two witnesses that I could mention are Blaine and Helen Amberge, who were there throughout the entire proceeding. Cass Nurster, who's a missionary, and the president of the Full Gospel Business Fellowship in Aurora, Illinois, whose name I don't recall at the moment. At any rate, there's none of this was done merely on the basis of what I'm telling you. I began to recognize many of these spirits, and they named themselves. And after a while, and I'm going to be very ruthlessly frank with you, and if you don't like me, I'm sorry, but that's the way I help people. A one named itself as masturbation, and I commanded it to come out of her, and it fought. It tore her. You could see it tearing up her inner being, and it 
argued with me. And it said, I'm not coming out. I have nowhere to go. I said, that's not my business. Then we went on and said, well, where shall I go? I said, that's not my business. You come out. Now, some of you may think this is fantastic, but I'll tell it the way it is. So this lasted about 15 minutes, and then it was defeated, and it said, as it was coming out, it said, I know where I'll go, and maybe I should have done this, but I said, where? And it said to the Playboy Club, I said, that would be a good place for you. You better get going. Now, this case also lasted over five hours. After a while, another spirit spoke. And it said, I'm a seducing spirit. Well, I said, come out in the name of Jesus. It said, I'm the seducer of the faint. Well, I said, still come out. It said, I'm the chief one. And this I've learned is true. If there's a group, there's one that's the chief. And Jesus said, it's the strong man and you have to bind it. Well, I said, still come out. It said, I have many roots. I said, come out with all your roots. And then the woman started acting in a strange way. And uh, sometimes she would name a doctrine or a religious group. But more often she'd either act the thing out or state the name or the doctrine. I am objectively convinced that I was dealing with an intelligence in that girl that was not the intelligence of the girl herself. Well, this went on until the woman was finally, as I believe, delivered. Two other spirits that were a surprise to me, and they named themselves. One was the demon of infirmity. I said, what kind of infirmity? Back infirmity. And I commanded this to come out, and her whole back, twitched and writhed as it came on. And another was a demon of pain. I said, what kind of pain? Nerve pain. I said, where are you? In her back and in her legs. And when I said this, this woman was absolutely in agony. She could not sit still. She couldn't keep her body still. Her whole body was absolutely racked with agonizing pain. And this spirit spoke almost like a bird would chirp. Uh, and I commanded it to come out. When it came out, the pain ceased instantly. Not gradually, but instantly. She was completely relaxed and free from pain. Now, those are very useful pieces of information. I have delivered scores of people from a demon of back infirmity. I had known, this was one thing I'd known before, that there was a demon of back infirmity because of certain things that had happened in my own past. I knew it was real, and I knew that I had myself, years back, been delivered from it. Well, in this way... I became, as I say, involved in this ministry. I never chose it. Many times I would gladly have abdicated from it. It is not, it's a ministry that arouses misunderstanding and criticism and misrepresentation. And I'm sure that I've made my share of mistakes. There are many things, if I had to do them again, I would do them differently. People came to me and said, Brother Prince, it's all right casting out demons. We believe in this, but why do you have to do it in public? It's embarrassing. It upsets people. So I thought, well, let's look at the New Testament. I, I didn't reject this criticism. I thought, let's take it to the New Testament. Well, then I w looked at the ministry of Jesus, and it was clear to me that he regularly did it in public, in the synagogue, in conjunction with his preaching ministry. You read in your own Bible, Mark 1.39 tonight, and you see what that said. And for a time, I was willing to put it off as a kind of side issue in my ministry and put it away in a little corner. But the Lord said, I don't want that. I don't want you to apologize for it. I don't want it to be done as a second grade ministry. I don't want it to be separated from the preaching of the gospel. It's part of the preaching of the gospel. It's part of the ministry of the full gospel. And I want it done without apology in public, just the same as everything else is done in public. And nothing that we do in the gospel needs to be done in private. Well, after this, I had many experiences which I will not go into in detail, but one weekend I was preaching in a large Pentecostal church on the East Coast, and it was a convention weekend, and the church was packed. The final night there were about four or five hundred people, as many as could get into the building, were there. And the pastor had more or less indicated that he would be glad if I would preach on this theme. And I did. Now I can do nothing without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's entirely vain. But if the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon me, then I know there will be results, inevitably. And this night, I made one appeal at the end of my message. I said, how many people here feel, in the light of what I've said, that you need deliverance? Now, there were about five or six ministers behind me on the platform, and this is their estimate, not mine. They said afterwards, Brother Prince, at least 75% of the people there raised their hands immediately. You can understand that the situation was chaotic. You couldn't get them into the aisles. You couldn't get them to the front. Well, we had a very powerful service. One woman stood up. She was, of course, a deacon's wife. You can take that for granted. And a minister's daughter. And she openly defied me. She shouted at me. And my principle is, if the devil defies you openly, he's got to be put to open public shame. So I stood on the platform and I commanded that demon to come out of her and bow before the name of Jesus. And this lasted about five minutes. It was quite tense. 
And then the woman, her head went slowly forwards and she sagged to her knees, came down and flopped. And I said to my wife, now you can go and minister to the woman. Next day the woman came to me and this is what she said. She said, I'm a minister's daughter and a deacon's wife. And I have had depression since I can remember in childhood. She said, I've told to people again and again that I'm sure this is a demon. And they always have said to me, you couldn't possibly have a demon, you're a Christian. She said, thank God that night I knew I had a demon. And she said, I could not control myself. I did not want to stand up and shout at you. She said, I just could not help myself. But she said, I want to tell you that last night when I went home and was lying in bed, she said, you can believe this if you will, that demon perched on the cover of my bed and said, I'm coming back. And I said, no, you aren't. In the name of Jesus, you go. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me with a similar testimony. I knew I had an evil spirit, but every time I went to anyone for help, they tell me, you can't have an evil spirit because you're a Christian. Wouldn't it be nice if it were true, but it isn't. Now, tonight, I'm going to close by just telling you this, that when it came to this climax, with as many as 75% in a Pentecostal congregation raising their hands to indicate they needed deliverance, this really upset me. Now, I don't say they needed deliverance, but I say they raised their hands to indicate. Nobody argued with them. And I don't argue with people. God has shown me not to do that. I preach the word. I hold up the mirror. And I say, you look in Find out for yourself. And I never have to argue with people. They come running. Well, this to me sounded almost unbelievable. And I began to deal with the Lord about this. And I said, Lord, could this be right? How could such a situation exist among full gospel people? And I almost said to God, I didn't actually say it, but it was in my mind to say it, God, I will not go on preaching this message any longer unless you will show me out of your word that it's in line with Scripture. And it was then, a few months later, in England, that God spoke to me this way. And again, he did not speak audibly, but to me it is absolutely clear. And this is what he said, in effect. He said, you have preached many times on the book of Joel, that the theme of Joel is desolation, restoration, and judgment, and that the desolation affected every area of the inheritance of God's people. And I said, yes. And he said, did you ever stop to think what caused the desolation? And I said, no, but I've got it now. An invading army of insects. And if I understand the voice of God aright, he said this, my people have been systematically invaded by the forces of the enemy. In every area of the church, from the pulpit to the pew, my people have been invaded by a fifth column, which is Satan's fifth column. And then I saw that the great climactic promise after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Joel 2.28, where it says, I come to pass afterward, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The final promise, Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. This is the outworking of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God's people today are being purged of the fifth column. And when that fifth column is gone, God's people are purified, reunited, and empowered. They're going to go out and do the job that has been waiting 19 centuries to be done, to preach the gospel in all the world for a witness unto all nations. But a church that is riddled and infiltrated by Satan's fifth column cannot do the job. Then the Lord said one more thing to me. He said, you've also preached from Joel that there are two trees, the fig tree and the vine. The fig tree represents Israel, the vine represents the church. I said, yes. Yeah. Then the Lord said, you can see how far away my people Israel have been from their God-given inheritance for 19 centuries. Having been a missionary to the Jews, I knew this. And indeed, you don't have to be a missionary to the Jews to know that they have been wanderers and exiles from the inheritance that God gave them in the land of Israel for 19 centuries. This year makes the completion of the 19th century. Then the Lord said this. He said, in my sight, the church, the fig tree, the divine, has been just as far away from its spiritual inheritance in Christ as Israel have from their political inheritance in the land. And that made sense to me. Tonight I believe that. I, tonight I believe that New Testament Christianity and living has been as far away from the Church of Jesus Christ for about 9th, 18th century as the land of Israel has been away from the Jewish people. And we are living in the times spoken of in Acts 3.21, the times of the restoration of all things. And there is a double restoration going on. Israel are being restored to their land, fig tree, and the church is being restored to its inheritance in Christ, divine. And one essential aspect of this restoration is the elimination of Satan's fifth coming. Now, I know that even as a preacher, 
I had problems with evil spirits. One of them was depression. For years I fought the spirit of depression. Struggled, fasted, prayed, did everything. Never got deliverance until I saw in Isaiah 61, 3, God says he will give us the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. And I saw that heaviness, depression, is a spirit. When I saw that, I was 80% of the way to deliverance immediately. The only other scripture I needed was Joel 2.32. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Tomorrow night, I'm going to seek to base this teaching of deliverance directly on the scripture. I'm going to give you two main things. What I have learned to be the symptoms that, that normally are indicative of demon presence and activity. And secondly, the conditions for receiving deliverance. And tomorrow night, on the basis of that, I will be ready to minister if there are those that want to be ministered to. Tonight, unless you just cannot survive another 24 hours, I do not want to minister to people because it will be much more effective after I have actually preached the word. I hope you'll understand me. I've learned by experience that it's better to lay a solid foundation rather than move in too rapidly and try to help you. And by the time I've instructed people properly, 80% of people can help themselves. They do not need somebody else to minister to them. So this, as it stands now, is the program for tomorrow night. Now I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet and we have a word of prayer and dismissal. Precious Lord, we praise you that we've been gathered in your name. Thank you for your presence in our midst tonight. Lord, I pray for what I've said to these dear people, that whatever I said that was true and from you will remain with them and work in them and do them good. And if I said anything, Lord, that was not pleasing to you, that was inaccurate or misleading, let it be blotted out of their hearts and minds, Lord. Lead us by thy spirit into the truth. And we thank you, God, with all our hearts for what you're doing today in the world for your people, for Israel and for the church. We thank you for this mighty sovereign intervention of Almighty God to bring deliverance and restoration to your people. Lord, help us to be in line with what you're doing. Help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading and direction in these days that lie ahead. Now as we dismiss and separate from this place, keep your hand of protection, blessing, and guidance on each one of us. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.